Good evening, everyone. Sarah who organized this class this evening is dedicating it to the to the memory of her parents. whose names are Should have a lichtig in Gan Eden. said that we have to live with Mashiach, so the, uh, we'll talk, talk about Mashiach, all of Hasidus is about uh, Mashiach bringing Mashiach, bringing redemption to the world. Redemption is consciousness, divine consciousness. Everything that we see and everything that we do is infused with, uh, with energy, with with light. So Hashem's light is, is the Mashiach. So since Mashiach and the redemption is such a general topic, it can be uh, discussed from many different angles. And the, uh, the particular point that we're going to try to make uh, this e- now this evening is is the, uh, the mashal, the allegory, the parable of the relation between the sun and the moon, that one of the, one of the uh, things that Chazal say based on a verse in, in Psalms and Tehillim, Ayin Bet, 72, it says that Yira'u Chaim Shemesh, that the people, that we the Jewish people in the whole world shall stand in awe, shall fear you with the sun, Yira'u Chaim Shemesh, meaning with the appearance of the sun, as the sun rises in the morning, everyone will stand in, in awe of Hashem. Yira'u Chaim Shemesh. And then the continuation of the verses, And before the, the moon, for generation after generation, in, meaning forever and, forever and ever. So there the, the Chazal say that the Shemesh represents Hashem as in another perhaps more well-known person in Tehillim that says Shemesh Umagen Havaya Lokim that the, the sun and the shield is the, are the two names of Hashem. Hashem Yudkei is the sun itself. And the shield that prevents the light of the sun from blinding us is Elokim, Shem Elokim Yamati Ateva. That's well known to us because it's uh, explained at length in Shara Yehud Ve'emunah, the second part of Tanya. So the Shemesh represents, symbolizes Hashem. And what, what about the Yareach? So it's important for us that the area, the, the moon, symbolizes the Mashiach. And Rashi says explicitly in his commentary on Tehillim that Yareach is the Mashiach. So in this particular verse, Mashiach is called the, the moon. Very often we, the Jewish people, as a whole, is called the moon. But if... Hashem is symbolized here by the sun and the Mashiach who comes to redeem us and to, to uh, materialize Hashem's uh, desire and creation which is the happy dwelling place below symbolized by the, 
by the moon, so we, the Jewish people, as in many other verses, are symbolized as the earth, actually. There are two symbols for Malchus. The Jewish people is Malchut, the last of the ten shirols. That can either be, be referred to as the earth or can be referred to as the moon. So, uh, as a luminary, it's once more a, a source of light and a source of consciousness, in, in this particular context, the moon is the Mashiach. He shines light to the earth, which is us, which is Al-Pipshat, literally all inhabitants of the earth. And the sun, as Hashem created two great luminaries because the, at the beginning of creation because the moon said that two kings cannot serve with one crown so Hashem said to the moon that diminish yourselves so it became the small luminary initially they were two great luminaries and then the, the moon diminished itself and became a small luminary that reflects the light of the sun and that relationship, once more, in this particular context, is that of Hashem to the Mashiach, and both shining to us, to the to the earth, to the Jewish people, to the world at large. Now, very often, the relation between sun and moon is a male-female relation. So the whole topic of the moon is a feminine topic. So even though the whole Jewish people is likened to the moon in three respects, it says that we resemble the moon and we calculate time based upon the moon and we will in the future be renewed as the moon. That is the quote from Chazal. Domim shanach, in this context, the moon is, is we, the Jewish people. That we are like, we look like the moon, we resemble the moon, and we have to understand what that means. And we, uh, and we count according to the moon and we will be renewed in the future as the moon once more the moon is promised that in the future it will it will not have to go through the cycles of uh, of of appearance and disappearance every month Haya or halavanako or achama, that's the verse in Isaiah, and that the light of the moon will be just like the light of the sun. And the light of the sun will be sevenfold more than the light of the seven days of creation. So there we're all the moon. So either the sun and the moon in one place it's Hashem and the Mashiach, in another place the sun and the moon were the moon, so still the sun would be then Hashem, the relationship between Kuchabrichu Shkinte, Hashem and His Divine Presence, which is the Jewish people. But within the Jewish people itself, it's very clear that the sun-moon relation is a male-female relation. Meaning that women especially should identify with the, with the moon. And since it has to do with Mashiach, and since here we have a group of women that want to bring Mashiach, that's why we thought of talking about the moon. <laughs> Every, everyone probably knows what you say, Milta uh, de Bichuta, at the beginning, that uh, in popular literature, in the last uh, several decades, one of the most uh, best selling books is Men Are From Mars and 
women are from Venus, which has some basis to it in Kabbalah, a little bit, but but uh, but definitely the sun moon relationship is much more so a man woman relationship. What's what's special about the the moon re- reflecting light? Is there some ma'ala, some advantage in reflect reflected light from the sun, which is even more than the than the direct sunlight? So it says yes. It says there's something actually more intellectual about the moon than the than the sun. That's why the moon is a basis of calculation. And not only is there something more uh, intellectual about the moon than the sun, if we're related to men and women, so the moon is like it says about women that a woman has an extra measure of of understanding more than more than a man. Actually, the very word "livana" has in it the letters "bina" understanding. But in Kabbalah, "chama livana," which is one of the pairs of terms for sun and moon, are very like the words "chokma bina," because "chama" is almost the letters "chokma wisdom," and "livana" has in it. Bina, and even more than that, if you calculate the value of the of the pair, so chamal bana equals exactly equals chokma bina. The number is 140. Two pairs that are exactly equal one another. So the the bana has some additional bina to it, just like a woman. But even more than that. And this is actually a paradoxical. In a certain sense, there's more intellect. We'll call it maybe intuitive intellect that the that the Levana has more than the Chama, but also that the Levana represents faith above reason. There's something totally super rational about the moon. That the sun is re- reason is is rational, and so a man would say, "Well, no, that I know that women are not rational, but uh, they're super rational." Because a man can't understand a woman because the woman is, uh, is has more understanding than him. But at the same time. Not only does she have some advantage uh, vis-à-vis understanding, but the real origin of the woman and the moon is emona, is simple faith. That's why in the merit of women, we were redeemed from Egypt, and the merit of women will be redeemed now speedily in our days with with Mashiach, because uh, the coming of Mashiach depends upon faith. On emuna, emuna how do how do we know that there's there's something totally above reason about the moon? Another verse in Psalms reads that Hashem made the moon for Moadim, for the seasons and for the holidays. It's more because we calculate time and the holidays based upon the months of the year. And that calculation is based upon the movement and the appearance and disappearance, the cycle of the moon. But then the the continuation, it says, that the sun knows its exit or its appearance. And the sages imply from this, from the, the second part of the verse, that the sun knows means that it's we can calculate exactly the 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 motion, the movement of the sun. But 
Yarech lo yadam there's something in, in the physics that's called a, a three-body problem. I've been also a little bit of physics. The relationship of the motion of the Earth and the and the Sun and the Moon is a three-body problem, and that's why it's not. It's impossible to exactly calculate where the Moon is going to be. That's why it's it's such a complex uh, problem in in the in the Torah for the rabbis every month to to check the witnesses that come to testify as to the new moon in order to to uh, sanctify the new moon in the time that we as it should be as Mashiach will come that we will sanctify the, the months based upon eyewitness the calculations are so complex that it's impossible to exactly know. Like there are many things, even in mathematics, that we can't know exactly, like the value of pi, a, a transcendental number, other things that are simply they're coming. They reflect such a uh, such a source, which is impossible for the human mind to know exactly. So the sages actually say that that's the difference between the sun and the moon. That in simple terms, the sun is knowable and the moon is unknowable. So once more, if we correspond the sun and the moon to male and female, so there's something knowable about the male and there's something unknowable about the female. And unknowable means that it's coming from a place which is called a radla, which is in a, a most important term in Kabbalah and Hasidot, the unknowable head of the crown which in the soul is experienced or reflected as simple faith. So once more, there's something about a woman that she is the essence and the, the power. In Hebrew, the word faith is one of the synonyms for strength, for strength of character. Faith is strength, and that strength of faith, of perfect and complete consummate faith in Hashem is a female property. So in the, in the intellect she excels in understanding and in essence she, her origin is, uh, is, is the unknowable head just like the moon is unknowable where it comes from. Okay, so after this uh, beginning, this introduction, let's, I wanted to turn, since we're now, we're now conversing in English, in the future when Mashiach will come, so the universal language will be the Shonah Kodesh, the Holy Tongue. But for the time being, and in order to, this is obviously Hashkacha Pratit, that before the Mashiach comes, the most universal language is, is actually English. And Bashkoch Apotis, we, we came from, from America or from wherever that, uh, that uh, English-speaking uh, countries. And, si- and since our task definitely is Hafatza, it's clear that we, we have to be involved with uh, Hafatza, which is spreading, once more spreading consciousness Messianic consciousness. So it's the, the vessel, the vehicle that we have to do that is the language. One of the great early uh, Mekubalim, his name is Rabbi Abraham Abu Lafia. So he said that one of the signs of Mashiach is that he will be able to use all the foreign languages in order to spread the word of uh, the word of uh, redemption. Actually, the Friedrich Rebbe said the same thing, that the that Hasidus has to be translated into all the languages, and this is the way to bring Mashiach. And the Rebbe, Rebbe said, if you remember, one of the famous, famous Hasidus of the Rebbe, that even in, in, in Prior, he said that now the Montani has been translated into Prior for, 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 for the blind, this is like the last, the, the final translation, this is a sign of, a sign of the coming of Mashiach. Once more, the most universal language to spread 
the word is is English. All right. So that that was all in order to justify what we're now going to <laughs> now going to to say. Also a little bit bider bidichuta, which means uh, with humor. Let's let's think about the word in, in Hebrew. There are three words for the moon. Yareach, the vana, those are two frequently appearing words in the Tanakh. And a less frequent word is Sahar. Sahar is the root of the Aramaic term for the moon, which is Sihara. But uh, in Hebrew it also appears Sahar. So there are three terms for the moon. Yareach, Levana and Sahar. Sahar is the same word that means prison, like Betasoa. In direct parallel and correspondence, there are three terms for the sun. And they go in pairs. Yareach, if the moon is Yareach, so what is the sun? There's even a verse in the prophet that says, Shemesh Yareach Ahmad Zuda. An idiom, Shemesh Yareach, stand together in the heavens. If this moon is Levana, so what is the sun? Chama. That's what we said before. That Chama Levana exactly equal Chokma Bina. If the if the moon is Sahar, so the sun has an, a name, a similar name, Cheres. They both share two common letters, Sar, in reverse order. Cheres is Chet Rish Samech, and that's the name of the sun in the in the Tanakh. And the corresponding name of the moon is Sahar. Why are there three pairs in the Lashon Kodesh? Why should there be three pairs of names for the sun and the moon? So the Abiza explains in Kabbalah that the, the reason for the three pairs is because each one of the pairs is the sun and the moon in a different world. That in the world of, there are three created worlds, the world of, which is total divine consciousness, which we want to reach, is Atsilu, the world of emanation. But in the three lower worlds where there is self-consciousness, which we want to be liberated from by Mashiach. So the sun and the moon in the world of Bria of creation, which is the world of self-conscious intellect, is Shemesh Yareach. In the Sfirot, as every world has all ten Sfirot. In terms of the Sfirot, so since the relationship between the sun and the moon is male-female, so it's usually Tiferet and Malchut. Meaning that in the world of Riyadh, the Tiferet is Shemesh, and the Malchut is Yareach. Then in the next world below, which is the world of formation, which is the world of, of emotion, of feelings, the heart, of inclinations, well, that's why Yitzhira, which means formation also, is like the Yitzhar Tov and the Yitzhar Ara. In that world, so the Tiferet, or the sun, is, is Chama, and the moon is Levana. And in the lowest world, which is the world of action, the world of deed, there the sun is Cheres, and the moon is Sahar. Right, but in English, so we just have, we don't have to have all these three pairs. We just have one pair, sun and moon. 
And once for now we're, we're uh, contemplating the moon. So, what, is, what does moon mean? Where, where does it come from? If one studies etymology, so most words in English are, come from Indo-European source, close to German, but goes all the way back to Sanskrit. But there are many studies, especially uh, recent studies, that, uh, that discover hundreds and thousands, actually, of English words which do derive or relate to Hebrew Hebrew roots. And one of them, one of the most important examples is actually, is the moon. So since we're talking about the moon and we're talking we're talking we're speaking now in English, so uh, so this is a very interesting uh, interesting point. Once more uh, another verse in Psalms, a verse that reads that reads uh, that we read every morning in our prayers. It says, Mone mispala kochavim, the chudam shemot yikra. God counts the numbers of the stars. To all of them, he, he calls by name. That word, Mone, means in Hebrew, in Hebrew means the count. In the saying of the sages that we quoted before, it says that we, the Jewish people, don't mean Lavana resemble the moon, and we count by the moon, meaning that we calculate the calendar. We count our days and we count our months in accordance with the moon. So once more, the the modern scholars say that uh, the very word moon comes from this uh, what we call the subroot of mem nun, like man, which in Hebrew means to count, and is the very word that is used by the sages to refer to to our relation to the moon. As it appears, especially in this verse in the Tehillim. What happens if uh, if we put a olive, the letter olive, before the word Mona? This is like the Rabbi said that if we want to convert exile into redemption, so you just have to add an, an olive into the word uh, Gola, and then it becomes Gula. Meaning that the raw material of the redemption is the exile itself. We don't have to. N- nullify or annihilate the exile. We just have to shine, to project into the exile the light of the olive, and then it automatically becomes transformed into into redemption. So what happens if I take the word, this word mone, which means count, and I put a olive before it, so then it it becomes emuna, faith. So this 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 is actually the, the beginning point that uh, that we wanted to to make and emphasize that the moon in English is actually a variation of the word emuna, which which means faith. So and, the, and once more, this is a feminine concept, meaning that that women especially are faith, and they have to project faith to count, what does it mean to count? To count is also a type of intellectual projection. I project my mind to some, to some uh, set, we'll call it, and I count the set. That's why in mathematics there are countable sets and there are uncountable sets. To count is the, is the basic function of the mind. So actually, the the same uh, scholars that, uh, that, uh, that that examine or analyze the etymology of words, where they come from, where they mean, and the words that are related to one another, so they actually say that to uh, that moon and moon is 
related is cognate to mind. One of our books is called Body, Mind, and Soul. In, in modern uh, thought, modern philosophy and, uh, and culture of the word and the concept of mind is very, very central. So once more, there's something about the moon, as we said before, that it, ha- that it ha- has to do with understanding, with the additional measure of understanding that's given to women, but there's something about the moon that, once more, moon is close to mind. Not only is it close to mind, but there's a man in the moon. So this, this I just opened the uh, book of etymology. It says that moon also is very close to man. It's close to man, it's also close to woman, but it says man. And there's a, there is one source. And in every culture, <coughs> there are different, uh, different stories about the man and the moon from time immemorial people have seen a man in the moon and uh, there is one source in the, in, in, the, in the Talmud that actually the appearance this obviously the Jewish consciousness if you look hard on the moon you can see the Talmud you know, the resemblance and the appearance of Yaakov you know, which is the origin actually of all Jewish souls so there definitely is a man in the moon. <coughs> and that man in the moon will be Mashiach, Eloke Yaakov, one of the terms in the Torah for Mashiach, is called Mash- the Mashiach of the God of Jacob. We said before that, that in the verse for the Yareach Dordorim, the Yareach is the Mashiach. So now let's say a few words physically about the physical moon, what, it, what we can learn about, uh, about ourselves and about consciousness. There's something mind, mindful and something man-like in the moon more than the sun. And it has to do with Mashiach. In Latin, and this also appears in English in different uh, variations, different forms. What, uh, how do you say moon? In, again, we don't know Latin so well, but uh, some words we should know. Who knows what what moon is in Latin? L- luna, luna. That's why we have the adjectives luna, lunar, the lunar calendar. The lunar calendar is the calendar based upon the moon. That's what's kind of, as, as an adjective, it, it appears in English. But how, how else does it appear? In what other context? A lunatic, I think, exactly. <laughs> Lunacy. Because according to, to belief, that this is not necessarily true belief, it could be superstitious belief. There's some relationship between lunacy and the uh, and moonlight, especially the full moon. As many uh, goyim are afraid of a full moon. We like the full moon. The full moon is Siyala Bashtamuta. Actually, there's, there's one source in the, also in Kabbalah and the Arizal that says that the difference between the word Yareach and Levana, Levana in Hebrew comes from the word Lavan, white. It's also a very important advantage of the moon even over the sun. Sunlight is not white, it's yellow. But moonlight is white. 
white is is higher than yellow. Right, so, uh, so in one place the Arizal actually says that when the word Levana appears in the Bible, it means a full moon. That it's all white. But when the word Yareach appears, it's a crescent. Which means this pagum, the word for crescent in Hebrew is begam, which is like a blemish. Meaning if the moon represents us or our state of consciousness, Yareach means a consciousness which is not full, it's only partially light. Light here is like conscious of, of Hashem, and partially in dark, and it, which means not conscious of Hashem. So, even, and this is also very interesting because we said before in another place the Arizal says the Arizal is in a higher world. It's in the world of, of uh, creation, and the Vana is in the world of formation. Means that in the world of creation, which is the intellectual world, there the moon is a crescent, and in the in the world of the heart, of the emotion, the world of itzira, the vana, there the, the moon is full. Lev Yisrael Chai, the Baal Shem Tov said that our, the heart, the Jewish heart, is is always complete. Even though Ani Yashinam Bakad even if I'm asleep in exile, but my heart is always awake and full. My mind, not necessarily so. What's important about the moon? What, what, what is the simple reason that the moon is a feminine symbol? Because of its monthly cycle. The word month in English also, obviously, it's a derivative of the word moon. A month is a moon. And a woman has a monthly cycle, which is called the 28 different campsites or times, the periods, the 28 periods of the book of Kohelet of Ecclesiastes. A time to, to be born, a time to die, a time a time of peace, a time to love, a time to hate, a time to be silent, a time to speak. There are 28 times, 14 pairs of times. Those 28 times, the word at time, there are different words for time, but here the word for time is at. At the kolchev, the ayin taf, which equals 470. Maybe somebody remembers when and the Rabbi said, what year the Rabbi said to that everyone should try, or that the whole Chabad community should try to establish 470 different uh, institu- new, new institutions of, of spreading, spreading Torah, uh, educational institutions. That was the Tavshin Memchet, the year that the, that the Rabbi passed away. Why did, he, why did he want this number? Because this number equals Chayim Mushka, 470. And the most important word that in the Torah that equals that number is Et, Ayin Tav, a simple two-letter word. And there are 28 of those Ets. That that is that is the one of the origins in, in the Tanakh and in the Bible for the for the monthly cycle. And the monthly cycle is the feminine. Cycle it means that feminine conscious consciousness is conscious of the monthly cycle. What is the monthly cycle? That the moon diminishes and then is as though it disappears, then becomes reborn, appears, reappears, grows, waxes and wanes, and at the epitome of its growth, it reaches its fullness. Fullness is the Levana in the heart. The 
the fact that the moon has there are actually two phenomena in the moon of light and darkness. One is the whole month, except for the for the high moon, for the full moon. So part of the moon is illuminated, and part of the moon is uh, is dark. But there's something even more. Uh, essential about lightness and darkness. The moon has two sides to it. And it's not the same thing. The moon physically is in synchrony altogether its rotation with the earth. It revolves around its axis exactly in one month as it revolves around the earth and that means what that produces and this is a there are several amazing things of how Hashem created or the scientist doesn't speak in terms of, of the wonders of creation how Hashem created the world but our purpose one of our purposes is to contemplate and meditate and to teach the wonders of creation who was involved with that in Sichot Lanor the rabbits and herself. Mitchay Moshe, one of her one of her greatest things, and the Rebbe was very pro to spread this was to called Niflo Tateva in Sichot Anor, to contemplate the wonders of creation. And the unfortunately, this is a, one of the greatest signs of exile that science teaches things without making a point of the wonders of creation. But there are many, well maybe I'll speak of two wondrous, it's called anthropic uh, phenomena about the, about the moon. One of which is the synchronous rotation of the moon with the earth, that there's no necessary reason for that at all. That since the moon completes its cycle very slowly, the cycle the, the the Earth revolves around its axis every day. But the moon is once a month, and there, because of that reason, there is always the same side of the moon facing the Earth. And there also always the other side of the moon, the it's called the farthest, the, the nearest side of the moon, which always is facing the earth, the same side. And there is the far side of the moon, which is always not facing, which is, all, which is some total unconscious. What does the moon represent? The moon represents consciousness. Now, in, that, in the side of the moon that always faces the earth, so it itself goes through phases. All of the 28 phases of the moon, all of the crescents, are all phases of the near side of the moon. Meaning that the near side itself has relative states of light and darkness to it which in consciousness, the light side of the moon is called Sad Mu'ar. It's like every personality, every character also has two sides to, to our personality, and which, which comes from two sides of our consciousness. One is the illuminated side. We have a Sad Mu'ar called illuminated side. And we have another side which is called Sad Afel the dark side. Everyone is is so much illuminated and so much dark. And obviously our task is to is to conquer more and more of the dark side and transform it into illumination. Which be conscious, conscious of Hashem, conscious of 
of our purpose in life, which is to bring Mashiach, to bring Gula to the to the world. So, even if say will be successful in making the whole near side of the moon light, illuminated, we haven't yet touched upon the far side of the moon, which is like some other world altogether, since the human eye never sees the far side of the moon until recent time that there's travel to the moon. But uh, it means that there's something that, that the far side of the moon represents some other world altogether, some anti-world. Now, even physically, there's a, another very important uh, phenomenon about the moon, about the difference between the near side of the moon and the far side of the moon, <coughs> that the the surface of the moon has a crust to it, a hard crust, and from what is now known in science, the crust of the far side of the moon is 30 miles thicker than the crust of the near side of the moon. Which in simple terms means that it's, in Yiddish there's a word, grob. <laughs> that the, the far side of the moon is tremendously more grob than the near side of the moon. So, if the moon is our consciousness, so we, our near side also is the, poten- is, the, is the near potential to illuminate ourselves. But we still have back there on the far side, which we there's no way to reach unless, unless we invent a psychological spaceship mm-hmm. to to reach it. But there's no direct way to reach it. And that far side is, is totally dark and it's 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 very, very grub to the extent that scientists don't understand why why that is so. So they the uh, hypothesize that scientists like to hypothesize. They hypothesize that maybe uh, originally the moon is is actually a harkava, a composite of two different celestial bodies. That one is a little bit more edel, and the other is more grob, and they somehow. Someone, which is Hashem, pasted these two together, which is the near side of the moon and the far side of the moon. But for all of this is in order to, to contemplate our own consciousness. That we, but for this is the meaning of what we said in the beginning. The Chazal say that we resemble the moon. First, we resemble the moon. Then we count. We calculate according to the moon, and then we we will be renewed as the moon will be renewed in the future. That the obvious is, is our faith. But our consciousness resembles the moon. Our mind, our active intelligence, what is consciousness? Consciousness is not yet active intelligence. It's just what we're aware of, my awareness. Everyone's state of consciousness, which is a state of awareness, Hashem has created this symbol to perfectly reflect what our consciousness is like. Because our consciousness resembles the moon. But we also have active intelligence. Which begins to begins by this by this function of counting, and we to calculate and to by our calculation to to establish holidays and so forth in accordance with the to, to live 
in accordance with the Torah. And we, now what are we distinguishing between we're distinguishing between consciousness and mind? We're here using the word mind. We said that Muna relates scholarly to mind. Mind in the sense of active intelligence and doing something with your mind, not just what you're aware of. So we resemble the moon, means that our awareness is like the moon. The moon is the perfect replica of human consciousness. And we count according to the moon, means that the moon also has this power of mind to calculate. In order to live according to the cycle of the Torah. And then we are in the future going to be renewed like the moon. That that represents our faith, our perfect faith, which is actually the, the ultimate origin of the moon. That our faith is the, the future. Future with the, which is the completion and the consummation that, as we said before, our Shem created the world to have a dwelling place below. In us, in our, in this physical world, in our families, in our homes, that all should be full of the light of Hashem, just like the Menorah and the Beit Hamikdash that we're reading about now in the Torah portions, that the light should shine in the house and from the house to the to the whole world. And this is our this is our faith the renewal, the ultimate renewal of the moon. Now there's another amazing phenomenon about the moon and its relation to the sun that also has no physical necessity behind it. Just this is once more a a perfect wonder of nature. The moon is about 400 times smaller than the sun, physically. Approximately 400 times smaller. Why, when we look at the moon and the heavens, like a full moon, it appears to be almost exactly the same size as the sun in the day. Why is that so? There are other uh, planets in the solar system that have moons. But there's no other planet, no other moon, that is so big in proportion to the planet as the moon is in proportion to the Earth. But still, the moon is very, very small in proportion to the sun. So why should they appear to be exactly the same size? in the heavens. Subjectively, they appear to be the same. Just like in the beginning it says that Hashem created two great luminaries. Why is that so? Because the distance of the sun from the moon and the earth is almost exactly the same as the proportion between the size of the sun and the moon. If the sun is 400 times bigger than the moon, the sun is also 400 times farther away from us as the moon. And because of this, once more, no reason at all for this to be the case. But because of this, Hashem wants the two to appear to our eyes as the same, as the same size. What is that size? How many degrees are there in a circle? This is one of the reasons of the... 360. 360. It's an approximation of the days of the year. Because a lunar year is 354. And a solar year is 365. So the means is approximately 360. That's why the 360 degrees to a circle. The size of the sun and the moon, which are all almost exactly the same, is one half of the degree in the in the sky. 
that the, the size of the sun and the moon is 1 over 720 of the full cycle of the of the of the sky around the earth one half of a degree that is the width of the sun and the moon in the sky does that number have any significance to it 1 over 720 the very first word of the Torah's brief sheet the the classic uh, text of Kabbalah, which is called Tikkunei Azor, there's the Zohar and there's Tikkunei Azor, is completely devoted to examining and interpreting the number of permutations of the first word of the Torah. If you have six different letters, how many permutations, how many different ways can you order the six different letters. So it's called six factorial. Six factorial, six times five times times four times three times two times one equals 720. Mm-hmm. Meaning that uh, it's the basis of the of Tikkuni Azor, that the first word in the Torah Breshi, it has 720 different permutations to it. So one of those permutations or consider this to be the whole uh, the whole measure of the of the cycle of the sky or the universe around the earth exactly one out of 720 that's the size of the moon and the and the sun why how does this how does this uh, reflect itself in nature Fixed by a very important phenomenon, which has also been studied from time immemorial, from the beginning of human uh, consciousness and uh, active consciousness, calculating the, the motions of the heavens, is eclipses. If the sun and the moon wouldn't be the same size, So there could not be a solar eclipse, a full solar eclipse. You know that many things, like even uh, Einstein's general theory of relativity, have been proven more or less because of of studying the phenomena of a solar eclipse. And what does that mean? That if the moon what, what, what is the difference between a solar eclipse and a lunar eclipse? At what time of the month? A solar eclipse means that the moon is now directly between the sun and the earth. A lunar eclipse is the opposite, that the earth is between the sun and the moon. So when does a solar, when can a solar eclipse appear that the moon is between the earth and the sun it can only appear on Rosh Chodesh or the day before Rosh Chodesh because if the moon is between the sun and the earth so it means we don't see anything our near side is dark That's why in a solar eclipse, you don't see the moon moving. Just all of a sudden, you see the sun disappearing. Because a solar eclipse is always on Rosh Chodesh, or the, the day before. It has to be. When the three bodies that the three body problems, if the three bodies are in line, because usually the moon is either a little bit above or a little bit below, so we don't, it doesn't produce a eclipse. 
But if it's exactly in line, then the on Rosh Chodesh, or the new moon, the moon will exactly cover the sun. Most mothers have made them no reason for this, for the fact that the two have the, are the same size. But if the other is, is, is the case, that the moon is behind the earth in relation to the sun, that the earth is in between, and they're exactly in line, so that's a lunar eclipse. When can, when can that happen? A lunar eclipse can only happen, lunar eclipse is more common than a solar eclipse. A lunar eclipse can only happen on the 15th of the month, on the, on the Sierra Bashtamuta. Because if the moon is, is the other side of the earth, it means that it, it, it's receiving this also very important. When the near side of the moon is dark, that's the time that it's closest to the sun. That it itself, on what for us is the far side, is receiving maximal light of the sun. When its far side is receiving the maximal amount of light, its near side, which we see, has no is, is dark. But meaning the the new moon is much closer to the sun than the full moon. The full moon is the farthest from the sun, but we see the side that is being illuminated by the sun. So we see a full moon. The dark side is very far away. There's another important thing about the moon, which also has to do with Purim, that the the moon is very cold. It says that there are there are certain uh, vegetables and plants that grow by moonlight. It's called Gerush Yerachim. So we said one thing, the difference between moonlight and sunlight, that sunlight is, is, has some color to it, some hue to it, but moonlight is, uh, is white. Another thing, that sunlight is, has heat to it. Sunlight has temperature, has warmth to it. Moonlight is cold. In that verse that the etymologists identify with the with the origin of the word moon in English, which is mune, means pala kochavemi, counts the number of the stars. The chulam b'shemoti kra, there are two verbs. The first word of the verse is a verb, and the last verse, the last word of the verse is a verb. First was the monet account, that says ikra. Ikra means to call, but it comes from the two letter root, kar, cold. And that's actually the, the last of the four, the four uh, uh, experiences, of, uh, the great experience that we have on Purim, which is called la yudim ha'taoram, v'simcham v'sasom yikar, the Jews had light, he had light and joy, and exuberant joy, which is called Sasson, and Yekar. Yekar is dearness. That word Yekar also, Chazal say, come, is related to the word to call, and also to the word Kar. There's something so cold about the, about the moon, the surface of the moon, that even though it's much closer than, say, faraway planets, it says that the moon is colder even than Pluto. But again, the moon is very, very cold. It approaches absolute zero. It's so cold. So you have to wear a really warm coat if you want to travel to the, to the moon. But uh, but uh, there must be something good about also about that coldness.
something dear, something valuable. The word yakav also means value. Those four words about Purim correspond to the four mitzvot that we perform on Purim. That the light is the reading of the Megillah, who's called the Torah. The Simcha is the festive celebration of Purim, the drinking, and the loyada. The Sason is giving gifts to friends, Mishra Achmanot. And the Yikar, the value, is giving charity, Staka, to the, to the poor. And to ever put out his hand, not to examine if he's really a poor man or not, whoever puts out his hand to give him with generosity, with great generosity. <coughs> so, so there's something that is very valuable about that yikar. The word for light in that verse in Purim, Layuti Maita Ora, is in the feminine. Because throughout the whole Tanakh, the word light is or, and only here it's ora. The light of Purim is, re- is called reading the Megillah. The Megillah is called by the name of Esther Hamalka. Not Mordechai, it's not called Megillah Mordechai, it's called Megillah Esther. What does Esther come from in Persian? There's now this, we have to live with the times. So this, uh, this class that we're now having about the moon is most appropriate for any particular feminine persona in the Bible, in the Tanakh. The one in, the, in Kabbalah, all women have to do with the woman, especially Rachel, men because of Malchut. But there's one woman whose name means moon. She is the moon, Esther. Esther is Esther. That in the Gemara says the star is the moon, it's like Sar, it's the third word, it's the word of the moon in the world of Asya. And her light of Mikinat Esther is a feminine light. And that light is called Ora, with the hay. So it begins in these four, the four words that the Jews had, Ora, Simchas, Asomiyaka, the two middle words are two different forms of joy. But the first word is light, and the last word is yikar value, but there's a very important verse in in the, the prophet Zechariah that reads that in the future, the light of the future we call or yikarot. Precious, the word yikar means like also precious, valuable, precious. It also means cold, but it means value and precious, it also means to call. After you count, you call by name, as in the verse that we said before. So the idiom is ori karot, is precious light, the light of the future. That precious light is the light, is the is moonlight. Not sunlight, moonlight. Consciousness, the, the consciousness of the soul, the messianic soul that actually there's a spark of Mashiach in each one of us. And when that comes to the full, that's the messianic consciousness of the future. And that is called Ori Karot, which is actually a, a union of Ola and Yikar, the first and the last word, which is in the mitzvot of Purim is reading the Megillah and giving charity <coughs> to, to the poor, which is more than the whole year should, should be, the amount of the charity. So, it's called Ma'ot Purim, just like the Ma'ot Chitim, it's Ma'ot Purim. Okay, so now let's say, after all of these different things about the about the moon, the most important word that we said is that moon, now, again, we like English because for this reason that moon it comes from the word emuna. Emuna is taking this word mone to count and putting an aleph at the beginning. One of the readings in Kabbalah of, the, of emuna itself is that aleph mone. 
the one counts to infinity. How does Hashem create? Well, Hashem is one. But the world is plural. How does plurality and virtually infinite plurality derive from total singularity and unity? So one of the exponent, deep exclamations, this, this is the essence of faith. Aleph Muna, the one, the absolute one, counts to infinity. And by counting to infinity, he creates plurality. That creation of plurality from unity and singularity is the mind, the active mind, it's called Seychala Poel, the active mind counting. Just like in this verse, he counts. By counting, he actually creates the reality, and then he, in order to establish it, to well establish it, it's called to give it kiyum, lasting existence, he names it. What is the difference between mind and heart? One of the simple differences it says in even the Tanya it says that the mind is like water and the heart is like fire and water is is essentially cold and fire is essentially hot. So when we said light, which is cold light, is actually very deep intellectual. Light is it's a Chabad-like light. In Chabad is an expression, only spiders. Don't. Consciousness should be, awareness should be so clear of something that it doesn't overexcite. Because to overexcite, to become excited, means that it's a, it's something unexpected. But we're, we should be so connected in our kindness <coughs> to Mashiach and to redemption that it should be called Ipshitus, is the term in the it's, it's, it's simple, it's obvious. That's called, that's positive coldness. Positive coldness means when the mind takes something as relates to something as absolutely obvious. This is the way it must be. Nothing to get excited about. This is it. All right, so now let's conclude all of this with uh, with an, another um, just pure uh, chasidus about the muna and how it relates with the woman, what's part of the woman in the home is the basis of, of faith. And uh, how we can uh, try to apply this in relation to everyone around us. But if a if a couple, a man and a wife, have and the wife gives gives the essential input of the faith, but the man also has, together with his wife, faith. So obviously that will reflect itself in the education of the children, that the whole home will be a home of, of faith. And it will go on to shine, just like the menorah, to, from the inside of the home to the outside and to everything that, that, uh, that the couple and the family accomplishes to bring Hero, the coming of Mashiach. When I say faith, what do I mean? Who faith in, in what? So we're talking Hasidut that faith actually can have five different objects to it. Who I believe in. 
Now this last part is based upon a, a principle that the Baal Shem Tov teaches. It's quoted throughout the Chabad Chasidus. Baal Shem Tov says something which, which really is a chidush. When you hear it the first time, you should get excited. It's just that when you when it becomes implanted in your consciousness, so then it becomes a, just becomes a, a given. Then you can positively be called about it because it's a given truth. It's an absolute truth. And that is that just as we believe in God, so do we have to believe in every Jew. Meaning the potential of every Jew. Now, how is this all going back to our, our moon image? Because we said the moon actually has two different phenomena of the darkness to it. It has on it, the near side, it has also half, throughout the month, it's half a dark and half light. Then it has the far side, which is just, for us, just totally unknown, the unknown side. Just totally dark. Emuna is the power to take dark potential and transform it into the nafochu, to take darkness, it's called la focha chashocha to transfer and transform darkness into light. That's the power of faith. So once more, the question is, who do we believe in? So here we have the statement of the Baal Shem Tov, that just like you have to believe in Hashem, you have to believe in every Jew. What does it mean to believe in a Jew? To believe that his darkness, to believe in his lightness, that's no, once more, no chidosh. To believe that also if the Jew, if you, if you see the Jew, it's like you're seeing the, a dark moon. But that darkness will become light. It has the potential to be light. There's, there is darkness that doesn't have the potential to be light. But darkness in a Jew is potentially light. And it partially, at least, depends on me, how I ab- observe him, how I believe in him, to manifest, to bring out that light. It's like it said in Hasidus, that if you're a malamit schus on someone, if someone, if you see someone doing something that you can interpret it in two opposite ways, either good or bad, so by interpreting it for the good, you're actually bringing out that you're realizing that good interpretation. Just like a dream. It says that a dream goes after the word. As you interpret the dream, that's what really comes about. We have to interpret every Jew for the good, and even the dark, we have to realize that the dark has the potential to be to be light, and it will become light, and become essential, it will become such great light that it's greater than light which is initially light. That's called believing in a Jew. So once more, that, the, the, the Baal Shem Tov says that just like we have to believe in Hashem, which also, what it means to believe in Hashem, that He's here even if I don't see Him simplest meaning, even if I I'm not always don't see Hashem in, in my life but if I believe in Him, as it says in Tanya, in different places like like Igerat HaKodesh Yud Aleph especially, if I believe the belief itself will Hashem will appear through the power of the faith so in the same way I have to believe in every Jew but the, not, these two levels are subdivided into five. That believing in Hashem is one, and believing in every Jew is actually is four. How so? Because believing in every Jew, there's a special belief that we have to have for tzaddikim. It's called emunat tzaddikim. To believe in the tzaddikim of the generation, especially the tzaddik that you're connected to, is the Chad Bedoro, Emunat Sadikim. Women are best at belief. That's their forte. So they're best for believing in Hashem, and they're also best for believing in the Tzadik. 
And what else? What a, and the tzaddik is a Jew. So it's, it's part of believing in every Jew. It's just the highest level. Then there's level number two, which is believing in Klal Yisrael, which is the potential of the Jewish people as a whole. It says that the tzaddik of the generation, the Chad Bedol and the whole Jewish people, are way exactly the same. They also have a relationship like the sun and the moon, that they appear exactly the same size in the sky. Some people tend to, like, in moments of weakness, of spiritual weakness, to give up on the potential of our people, Chas Shalom. Because our people, you, you, you look at what's, what's happening in the world and you see that we're, we're not getting our act together for some reason. And so you, see, you can say the Tzaddik, the Rebbe, is, is 100%. He's 100%, he's the potential Mashiach. But, uh, but uh, the people will have to get their act together. And they're not, they're not doing it. It's going the opposite direction. And there's, everybody is stubborn. Jews are stubborn. So if you're stubborn, anti-Mashiach, you're, you're stubborn. Just like if you're stubborn, Mashiach, it's good stuff. But so much more, the, there could be a tendency to, to give up on believing in the people, in our people as a people, the potential of the people. Then there's the next level of faith, which is simply the faith in every individual Jewish soul. That this can actually begin with your own spouse in your home. That maybe you're disappointed with the with the behavior of your spouse. Maybe you're disappointed with anybody. But let's begin from the home. Don't give up. That's exactly what the Baal Shem Tov said. He said that believe, believe. If you believe in him, you'll bring out his good, his his light. You'll illuminate his darkness by believing in his potential. And what's for this? Believe his strength. What's the final level of belief? Is believing in yourself. Which is harder, should be harder, than believing in anybody else. Because if there's a tendency to give up, <laughs> so it's most in relation to oneself. Because Yada Inish Benashe, everybody knows himself the best, and he knows his shortcomings. And the shortcomings are very, very short. And uh, very, uh, very, very dark. Never give up on yourself. You have to believe in yourself. You're all, I'm also a Jew. So once more, believing in the other, the Baal Shem said, we'll go back, the Baal Shem says, just like we have to believe in Hashem, we have to believe in, 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 the, in, in every Jew. But that believing in every Jew has these four levels to it. The four levels are like you would give up. You would believe in Hashem. This is a, a beautiful and perfect model of what's called the Kutzos Yud, the crown or the the tip above the Yud of Hashem's name you would give up. And the four letters of Hashem's name. There's one Yud, Yud is like here, there's one Jew which is the perfect Example of how the Jew should be, of how Hashem created a Jew to be. That's the tzaddik. And I have to believe in him. And once more, even though he's already a tzaddik, I have to believe very strongly by, by believing to connect in him. And by believing in him, I also reveal his own makifim, it's called in Hasidut. Because everyone has inner light and has outer surrounding, encompassing light, 
which there's an infinite amount of which which can and should be incorporated and brought into his inner light by me believing say in the Rebbe that's coronating the Rebbe what does it mean to coronate someone? the Rebbe himself said that he has to be coronated both by us and by God by Hashem coronate bring means bringing like, the crown down on the the crown is called the makif, the surrounding light. My very faith, the strength of my faith in the tzaddik, is is bringing to him himself his makif, his crown to him. But the same is true in relation to all of the of the these levels of the Jewish people that we have to believe in, to believe in the people as a people. And to believe in every individual, every other individual, and also to believe in, in myself. So all of this is the moon, that the moon is emuna, out of Monde. And through this, the merit of Hashem, we should we should merit in the in the merit of the of the of the women who symbolize the moon. So the Gula Amitit Vashti Mai De Mashiach Titkeno Techo Vumead Mamash Amen If anyone wants to ask a question, it's